absolutely uh, the number one. Uh, that's probably the biggest impact we can do. So that's one example where these silos really need to come together if we're going to take this further forward. John uh, got together about 40 people to come up with the challenges document. Levels of inflammatory proteins like TNF being really high that we would treat with medication. There was one well done study in Europe where they didn't just ask patients because it's difficult to say when you're stressed and when you're not, especially in hindsight. So there's solid biologic evidence that stress can uh, sort of get you closer to the threshold. We know um, statistically that the biggest predictor of uh, developing IBD is in a family uh, of people with IBD. So the familial uh, risk factor is, is, is quite clinically proven, I think. Now, the mechanisms are exact, not exactly sure. So we would say that best predictor is a sibling or an offspring of a patient with IBD. The biggest effect is first generation but we heard of cousins and aunts and uncles and second cousins and remote uh, um, uh, relatives also develop disease. So, but, but the first, uh, the, the so-called um, first degree relative, the, the offspring or, or sibling is the highest, or parent is the highest risk. Uh, so I think Gene Dermot would clearly say that's a genetic predisposition. I would agree with that. And so for those in the room who might have three or four um, children that, that, that are related to another child that has disease, um, what, what can we do now or what are we doing to predict who in that genetic subset um, might um, develop disease and when? Well, right now we're not doing a lot, although the, the GEM study is probably the, I mean, the only the only good uh, study that I'm aware of that, that's actually looking at that. So what we are doing is trying to identify the genes that are uh, predictors of disease onset. Um, we clearly uh, will have that from the GEM study, although the numbers may not be sufficient to, to look at that. Uh, all of the genetic uh, work that's going on is identifying risk factors that, of course, has to be applied in a, uh, in a family to actually determine that. And that's a whole other issue. Are we ready to do that? Which I think would be a great topic. Yeah. Uh, so um, the, but then the microbiome is also potentially a predictor. So we're clearly working on that aspect. We're trying to identify Crohn's and UC related microbiome, starting with Crohn's because the effect of microbiome is greater, just like genetics, in Crohn's disease than in ulcerative colitis. Antibiotics work in, uh, uh, in Crohn's colitis, for example. I think um, the other thing to expand on what you're saying is the whole issue we were talking about earlier is biomarkers. Yeah. And so in potentially in at-risk individuals developing yeah. um, studies to, to look at yeah. biomarkers of related individuals. Right, and, and so clearly the, cal the fecal markers, the genetics, the serologic markers, proteomics, et cetera, uh, are all, and even metabolites in the stool, uh, all are potential, but most of those aren't yet being integrated into family studies. Two observations. One of them is about why prog prognosis is a, is a ridiculous way to talk about disease, and then the other is what here is a cure as opposed to treatment. So prognosis, um, you know, in pathology particularly, we're involved with prognosis, making information to predict what will happen. But really prognosis is whether you have a treatment or not. And if it's severe, if you don't have a treatment. If you have a treatment, uh, like, like diabetes used to be a fatal disease. Now we have insulin and it's not a fatal disease. So the prognosis is totally different. So I think that we should try hard not to talk about and work on prognosis, but instead uh, identify definitive treatments. With regard to treatments, um, 
that then becomes a cure question. Let's suppose that we identify that for a certain person, the certain bacteria are a problem for them, and they need to then modify their diet and mon monitor their microbiome to make sure that they keep those bacteria out of their system. So that's what they do, and if you do that, then they're free of disease. Let's suppose we could do that. Would you call that a treatment, or would you call that a cure? Or if you found out that, uh, that molecule num pathway number seven, like what uh, uh, Dermot was talking about, certain biochemical pathway in the cell is out of whack for genetic reasons. So you have a pill that could move it into, the, into where it should be. So now you're taking that pill every day. Is that a treatment or is that a cure? So uh, what do you guys think? Because we have to, because when we, you know, this organization, all, what we all are doing individually, and what the CCFA is doing is, tr I think, is trying to make a cure. But I think it's important for us to understand what that, what, the what word we mean actually, by that what means. The word actually means. Well, I mean, to me, to me, I would say, I think a treatment is a cure. We're all adults. We all have our profile of strengths and weaknesses. That's what life is. And so if we find out what those are, you learn you learn how to make that all work for you. That's like living as an adult would be. And to me, um, uh, th for that reason, in that context, I think a treatment is a, a definitive treatment. Effective is a well, treatment is cure. Yeah, I mean, I, as always, John brings up the big picture. Um, and I guess that's why he's the chairman of pathology. You know, he, think, he thinks big. But John, in answer to your question, a, a treatment becomes a cure when it lasts forever. You mean to take it once or just that you, n you never well, have, the disease is now silent? No, it, it can be either way. You know, it can either be a cure that you have to take for a long time or you correct an underlying defect that never recurs, then it's a one-time or short-term process. But I think that this is, you know, it's a, obviously it's a semantic issue and I think in some ways right. an important semantic but, but, issue. But, I'm, but I'm, yeah, I mean, I, I gave my bias yesterday that a cure is a correction of the underlying process. And so... But should I, that be the only thing? I mean... No, 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 no. Let me, let me continue. So I, I, would, I would argue with you a little bit about why we, sh we should worry about prognosis. So we worry about prognosis because we can immediately, if we know prognosis, we can immediately apply our aggressive, non-aggressive treatment at this time point immediately. So if we know that from the pediatric uh, risk stratification or, or from Corey's studies <coughs> uh, or from Dermot's studies that, that some patients with some marker have a bad outcome, we can immediately apply the aggressive treatment to that population with good conscience. I can't right now start everyone on infliximab because it's too expensive and it's too toxic for the, for the for, yeah, for but, everyone. but roughly, I don't know, you know, 40% of people don't respond to infliximab. It's right. not whether it's strong or weak, it's right. whether no. it's the right But, but I'm, I'm just saying, in principle, if I know today that someone has a bad prognosis, yeah. I, can I can put them in an aggressive treatment, and if one doesn't work, I'll do that. The optimal approach is to understand the disease process and correct the underlying process or target treatment to that pathway. <laughs>